Hey friends, the 4th of July is tomorrow, and what is more American than half the country fighting with the other half of the country about just about everything? Proud to be an American. Of course, I'm talking about oversimplified and the Civil War. We looked at Civil War Part 1 a few days ago. Today, jumping right back into it with Part 2. Welcome back, friends, and a special welcome. Welcome to all the new friends out there. I'm Yo BGS. And if I'm looking a little scraggly today, it's because I spent the better part of the weekend uh, going ghost hunting, and let me tell you, that is... Now I gotta get back into it today with, uh, well, something that inspired, I feel like, a lot of ghost stories, and that is the Civil War. Oversimplified did an incredible job boiling this entire thing down to, well, just about an hour in total, and today we're looking at part two of the Civil War. If you like these videos, by the way, if you dig what I'm doing, please make sure to subscribe. A huge chunk of the people who watch my videos aren't subscribed, and it helps out more than you know. Okay, here we go. Again, with the fact that the two capitals are like 100 miles apart despite having the entire country to go off of, let's see how this uh, comes to an end. The Union's struggle to take control in the East continued. Elsewhere, the war raged on. The Confederates attempted an invasion of Kentucky, hoping the state as a whole would join them, but they were pushed back. The Indian Territory saw Native American tribes ally with one side or the other in the hopes of securing rights after the war. Along the Mississippi, General Ulysses S. Well, and that was part of the thing too, right? The U.S. sort of knew which tribes didn't like each other, and the tribes knew that the U.S. didn't like each other, so I feel like a lot of alliances got formed sort of on that uh, along those lines as well. Grant remained one of the few Union generals scoring major victories. With his best pal, General Sherman, by his side, Grant led his armies down the Mississippi to the Confederate stronghold of Vicksburg. Both sides knew that if Vicksburg fell, the Confederacy would be split in two, and the Confederates prepared for an intense defense of the city. But back in the East, Lincoln still wanted somebody to march south and take Richmond. And then you think about how long it took... Well, at this point, had the telegraph... I think the telegraph had been invented. Yeah, because we're in the late 1800s, but I was thinking about how long it takes news to get from one side of the battlefield to the other, and it's like, these guys would be sent essentially across the country to lead the battles and not even know what was going, like, you know what I mean? Sherman's marching, and Washington could have fallen for all he knows, and he's just going Having after given it. given General McClellan the boot, he needed a new man in charge. Oh God, Eleven. I forgot about McClellan and just not ever wanting to do anything. Mr. President, option one is General Hooker. Bit of a nutcase, but a good general. Option two, his qualifications are his name is Burnside and he has freaking dope ass sideburns. <laughs> Say no more. So General Burnside was put in charge of the Army of the Potomac and sent south. Lincoln hoped he find- I mean, look, if, if a huge chunk of intimidation is what you look like, any man who can go outside looking like this and not think twice about it is not somebody you want to, because clearly, like, he has no regard for human Ooh, life. A general who could succeed. Burnside met General Lee at the city of Fredericksburg, where he intended to rapidly cross the river and take the city. But the Union War Department was too slow in delivering the pontoon bridges, and the two sides were forced to camp across from each other, close enough to speak. Hey, Yankee, ready to get your butt kicked? Yeah, right, Rebel. God is on our side. No way, God's on our side. Oh, you think so? Well, why don't we ask him? Hey, God, whose side are you on? <laughs> now, they, see, I always ask if these, like, little anecdotes that Oversimplified works in are true stories. This one, obviously, nowhere close to the case, but, like, you wish it was. Because people put enough stock in divine intervention back then that it may have, it may have caused a sooner peaceable resolution than, than what we got. Dude, uncool. With over 100,000 men, the Union Army finally launched their massive attack on the 11th of December. But by now, the Confederates had amassed their forces. During the battle, wave after wave of brave Union men marched headlong into a brutal Confederate onslaught. Even the Confederates couldn't believe what they were seeing. And in one moment of camaraderie, a Confederate sergeant, unable to take it, reportedly came out into the field to tend to the Union wounded. Seeing this, the Union troops held their fire. Still, Burnside and his forces were soundly def- You appreciate that level of humanity in an otherwise ridiculous time. And I say that knowing, you know, that 40 years from now, I think for around 30, 40 years from now, World War One's going to break out. And that's where we have those trench charges where it was literally just, all right, guys, meet shield and best of luck to you. And then 20 years after that, 
you know, we get uh, D-Day where it was literally hundreds of thousands of people and it was like, okay, meet S.H.I.E.L.D. and just hope for the best. And I don't know, you, you think about the way that warfare is now and at least we're not resorting to lines of men meet shielding but in some regards then you don't have these moments of humanity it's it's more sanitized which may i don't know i was gonna say it may not be the better way to go but i don't think war is ever really the the better way to go at fredericksburg and forced to retreat lincoln's popularity and northern morale continued to plummet especially as the winter heading into 1863 was bad the winter camps were rife with disease the food was less than appealing on Ugh. both sides, men began to leave. Hey, where do you think you're going? I'm uh -oh. deserting. What? This music. I feel like honey's coming. Sponsor at sponsor mention. What? Don't you love your country? Yes, I do. And I'm trying to get back to it as quick as I can. Lincoln, ever the kind and caring man he was, spent much of his time pardoning deserters' death sentences. Oh my. Here's a 17-year-old boy sentenced to be hanged. Well, I'd better suspend his sentence or he'll be suspended tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> what? To try to keep the numbers up. It's funny, but, you know, constipate conscription. Both sides had introduced conscription. There was controversy in the North, however, since rich men could simply pay to have someone else fight on their behalf. Riots broke out in New York City with enraged mobs furious at the idea of going to fight for slaves, an idea that many of them simply did not support. However, after so much pressure, the Union had finally begun allowing black men to enlist. And these men, knowing what they were fighting for, signed up. By the end of the war, nearly 200,000 troops, 10% of the Union Army, would be black. The valor and bravery they showed throughout, silencing critics. Okay, well that last guy was useless. Okay, so Burnside did nothing. But... What... If... If the... North had allowed African Americans to enlist right away. How do, and, and I ask this because I'm not somebody who's an expert on this situation. If the North had allowed African Americans to enlist right away, would that have helped end things quicker? You know what I mean? Because then ultimately they wouldn't have had the, this, this huge cavalrous surge of troops in like the second half of, the war, everybody would have been fighting in their ranks all along under McClellan, under Burnside, and, you know, who, who knows if they would have given up at that point, which would have caused other African Americans to not enlist. Let's try this hooker fellow. General Jeff It's one of those things where it's, it's just interesting to look at all the what-ifs of history and had things not played out exactly how they did. How would how would things have fallen? The hooker was put in charge of the Army of the Potomac, and once again Lincoln oh, ordered no, him to silly move hooker. south and take Richmond. Hooker met Lee at the Battle of Chancellorsville, where Hooker had over twice the men Lee did. Lee was forced to defy all military convention and split his smaller force into two. Lee had absolutely no chance of winning, and Lee won. It was his master. But how? Lee did suffer one significant loss during the battle, though. As his right-hand man, Stonewall Jackson, was riding back to the Confederate lines at night, the nervous Confederate troops, unable to recognize him, opened fire. You boys done goofed up. Oh, Jackson died yeah. eight days later. As for Lincoln, he couldn't believe it. It was yet another loss. Why didn't the Union ever, and I'm, maybe they did consider it, but it feels like this direct line is obviously the most defended. Why not try... Well, then again, West Virginia's really mountainous. Because, see, the, the border looks like it's the Appalachians there. I was going to say, why not try and come around and launch an invasion over the mountains? But, yeah, I, my guess is getting over those would have been nigh on impossible. So that would be... That would be why the straight line was the way they went. You boys done goofed up. Jackson died eight days later. As for Lincoln... He couldn't believe it. It was yet another loss, and Northern support continued to waver. While the Union kept on struggling in the East, out West, unconditional surrender Grant was making moves as always. In an attempt to take Vicksburg on the Mississippi, he made a series of risky and bold movements. He sent a cavalry raid and feigned Sherman North to... <laughs> ...movements. He sent a cavalry raid... I can't read that person's name. ...and Cheerson? 
Sherman north to confuse the enemy. Then, aided by a fleet of ironclads on the river, he raced his army south to cross the Mississippi. Aware that the terrain to the north was restrictive, instead, he strategically moved northeast, hitting Vicksburg's supply line and defending his rear from Confederate armies in Jackson. Once he reached Vicksburg, the Confederate defense became Damn. hardened, and Grant was forced to settle in for a month-long siege, during which time he got rather bored. Despite not taking the city, Lincoln loved it and encouraged Grant to hold firm. It would only be a matter of time before the Mississippi was in Union hands. Around this time, the people in the west of Virginia who had remained loyal to the- Okay, see, I was, I was there. I was just a little bit early when it came to this. And one other thing I wanted to mention is it's very interesting how- I hesitate calling it propaganda because that has such a bad- um intonation you know an implication of using that word but it really does feel like a lot of what we learned in u.s history in america and again i'm somebody who learned i learned this story in cleveland i learned this story in northern west virginia in charleston south carolina and in blyville arkansas so i feel like i got the most balanced uh hearing of this that you could and even then you didn't hear that the union was having such a rough time almost everywhere it's the union was this united front and everyone was happy and everybody da, 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 da. and then world war one comes along and it's yeah the u.s ran in and everyone ran away and da, 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 da. in world war ii same thing now by the time i was in school obviously uh when they were retelling vietnam that was a little bit different but uh, and, well, and honestly, they just kind of glossed over it. They're like, Vietnam happened, and it's the present day. And you're like, wait, that's like 40 years you just skipped. And they're like, yeah, don't worry about it. So it's interesting to me to find out how low morale actually was in each of these conflicts. And I don't know. Let me know in the comments if you feel the same way when you found out sort of the real history of these wars. If it, you sat there sort of in disbelief. Because that's where I've Even been. throughout, finally broke away to form their own state. They could have named it anything in the world. But Kanawha, Vandalia, Big Mountain Mama State. I would be behind that. Florido, Canada 2, Mississippi, High School Musical, The Musical, The Series, The State, or Left the Virginia. The creative minds at the time came up with the ingenious West Virginia. Back in Washington, Lincoln once again Even wanted though parts of Virginia are farther west than West Virginia. Virginia. Back in Washington, Lincoln once again wanted a new general to take command. Oh my goodness, why do all these 19th century generals look so bust? Look, we got Sleepy Eyes Joe here. That's Princess Leia with a mustache. <laughs> E.T. phoned the doctor. <laughs> why don't we give Snapping Turtle McGee here a shot? So General Snapping Turtle McGee was put in charge of the Army of the Potomac. And it was a crucial time for the Union. Maybe if Lincoln wasn't such a mean girl. <laughs> The generals wouldn't have broken up with him as much as they are. Because once again, the Confederates decided to go on the attack. So far, they had done exceedingly well militarily. But as the we have a military, some military progress, lots of military progress, pretty darn good military progress. War kept going. The Confederate economy. But no economic downturn, economic downturn, lots of econ economic downturn. Mucho grando economic downturn. And I love that they always. See, this is always bold to me, uh, oversimplified pointing out they've run out of markers and now just have to resort to whatever materials they have to continue the downside. was crumbling. Riots broke out in the streets of Richmond as the price of bread skyrocketed. Supplies were dwindling. Jefferson Davis the wanted to send men west to rescue Vicksburg. He who controls the bread controls the world, my friends. Because it's always, whenever Oversimplified talks about a revolution, it's the price of bread. But General Lee knew the longer the war lasted, the worse their chances got. And he still hoped if he could just threaten DC, the already demoralized North would surrender. So in June 1863, with the momentum behind him, General Lee once again entered the North, fighting his way through Maryland and into Pennsylvania. General Meade set out to meet him for what would be the most significant battle of the entire war. If the Confederates won, D.C. could fall. If the Union won, it would be a turning point as the Confederates would run out of steam and the small town that was to get caught up in the crossfire of the largest battle in American history was Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. On and interesting that Lee was the one who went for the flanking maneuver first. Although, again, military experts, is this considered a flanking maneuver or is it just an encircle? June 1st, units from each army encountered one another and skirmished through the town itself. 
the townspeople were forced to take refuge, except for one man who reportedly ran outside for a strange reason. Joseph, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm not gonna let them take my beans. How Hell many yeah. times do I have to tell you they're not here for your beans? <laughs> By the second day, over a hundred thousand. I love that thought because people could be isolated from the world at that point. So maybe he didn't know. Obviously he did, but maybe he didn't know that a war was going on and he just assumed that they were the town to town bean raiders coming after Men him. stretched for miles across the battlefield. Lee took the initiative, deciding to hit the enemy's flanks, and he came very close to breaking through the Union's disorganized left. But Union Colonel Joshua Chamberlain ordered a desperate bayonet charge, smashing into the Confederates and forcing them back. The Union forces held across the line. On the final day, Lee believed the Union Army had fortified its flanks, so he decided to finish them off with one massive central assault. The Confederates rushed at the Union lines during General Pickett's charge, and this time, it was the Union's turn to unleash hell. Dude, Lee no had correctly way. guessed Lee's strategy, and the Confederates were decimated. How do you... How do you... I ask this in every video, and people are getting increasingly mad at me, but... You would have to literally just check out of your body if you were a soldier in that point. Like all of your, all of your morality, all of the things that like, you know, when you look over a bridge and your brain tells you not to jump, like you just have to, like Yugi and the Pharaoh, right? Send Yugi off to play in some maze while your brain just goes murder machine for a little Forced bit apparently. Turn and flee. A devastated General Lee called out to his fleeing and wounded men, telling them it was his fault. And after holding for a counterattack that never came, he ordered a retreat back into Virginia. The North had just managed to score a massive victory, and one they desperately needed. And if that wasn't enough, in the West, after a month-long siege, Vicksburg finally fell. The North now held the Mississippi. And better yet, it was the 4th of July. With control of the Mississippi... What, what a coincidence! Although I feel... <laughs> General, it was the General McWhiskey, apparently. Fourth of July. With control of the Mississippi, Union forces moved into Arkansas and Tennessee. Tennessee in particular saw heavy fighting, with Union General Rosecrans masterfully pushing Braxton Bragg's General army Gildenstern? of the Tennessee out of Tennessee. He suffered a major setback, however, at the bloody Battle of Chickamauga and ended up under a Confederate siege at Chattanooga. At one point during the siege, a temporary truce was declared so that wounded men could be recovered. And often in the Civil War, during these small truces, men from both sides would meet in the middle to trade things like tobacco, coffee, and maybe even honey. Uh, Do you like honey? Uh, okay. All right, we got to use Oversimplified's link here. Look at that. You can get so much pizza, all the meats. You can be a Chad rolling in money if you just use honey. His code, honey, oversimplified. It, it apparently gets you 85 free um, Union and Pacific uh, uh, greenbacks, I guess. I don't know. That's not official. Just that's the link. If you want to help him out, I'm sorry, oversimplified, that my my uh, version is probably not as good as yours. Slash oversimplified. That's joinhoney.com slash oversimplified. There you go. His, in his words, not mine. Thank you. Now, where was I? Oh, yeah. Vicksburg? 4th of July, and the Siege of Chattanooga. Thankfully, General Grant, now in charge of all Western Union armies, showed up and karate kicked Bragg right back into Georgia. Like this. <laughs> With Sherman and Hooker. Like this. The flying, I wanted to see if it was the Liu Kang bicycle kick. <laughs> With Sherman and Hooker, Grant took on Confederate positions in the mountains around the city, including the famous battle above the clouds and Mission Ridge. Grant continued to be Lincoln's number one guy. With these victories, Lincoln hoped the war was finally turning. Back in Gettysburg, the entire town had been turned into a hospital to care for the scores oh of Oh my god. Men. The Gettysburg bad dress. Throughout the war, on both sides, women such as Clara Barton rose to the occasion, doing crucial work on the home front and volunteering as nurses. For those who had given their lives, a new national cemetery was to be established at Gettysburg and Abraham Lincoln traveled out to attend the opening ceremony. At the event, the main speaker spoke for two hours. Then, Abraham Lincoln was called forward to give some brief, appropriate remarks. In just two minutes, he masterfully and poignantly iterated America's national purpose and the need to continue the fight. The Gettysburg Address would become one of the most famous speeches in American history. 
While they were now making progress, the North still couldn't find a decisive victory in the East. There is something to that level of concise, concisity, concession, something to that level of like speaking to the point, right? It's a speech that people can memorize if they're so inclined and, and recite. I don't know that anyone is memorizing, again, Republican or Democrat, anyone's State of the Union speeches. Um, you think about the, the date they'll live in infamy speech that's another one that was fairly concise as well and i mean heck i'm a youtuber that makes videos that are 45 50 minutes long so brevity is obviously not the soul of my wit but there there's something to being able to get everything you need to say in a really short time and have people not take it as you being lazy essentially and that was bad news for lincoln because his presidency was now in its fourth year in 1864 there was an election coming the Confederates knew this too, and with little hope left of being able to Why does he have the North a BTS calendar? They believed their last shot at victory may be in the election, since Lincoln, emancipation, and the war itself weren't exactly popular. People in the North were sick of war and wanted to put it behind them. Robert E. Lee hoped that if he could just hold out and continue to inflict more defeats, the people of the North would vote Lincoln out and replace him with a Southern sympathizer who may be willing to negotiate. Lincoln knew now he desperately needed a victory. Now, I know what you're thinking, but oversimplified. If Lincoln loves General Grant so much, then why doesn't he put him in charge of the campaign in the East? Well, guess what? I mean, he's about to. Isn't Grant one of the only six-star generals in history? There, There's like, I think there's like four or five of these six-star generals. Like Washington was one. Grant might have been one. Um, and then there were a couple. It wasn't Eisenhower, I don't think. But there were, I think, a couple in each of the world wars where it was basically like, yes, the five-star general is in charge of the army, right? The, I don't know, the five rear admiral is in charge of the, the navy. But then they all answered to this guy who was like on the side of the president. And when I started that sentence, I it, it sounded more poignant than I thought, but I think kind of came off the rails there. You've hit the nail on the head. You're bold, Grant. I'll grant you that. I'm promoting you to general-in-chief, and I ain't taking you for granted. Now I want you to go defeat Lee. Grant me my wish. Please stop. So Grant was put in charge, and he came up with a new plan. He wanted to press the Confederates on all fronts, with General Banks to capture Mobile, Alabama, General Sherman moving south to Atlanta, and Grant joining the Army of the Potomac as they advanced through Virginia. In it's almost like he'd been thinking about becoming general. This is very much the, like... Grant would be talking to his troops and be like, all right, if I were in charge, boom, you here, you here, you there. And then when he gets the call up, he's like, okay, plans are in place, let's go. In 1864, that plan went into action. Sherman steadily advanced on Atlanta, facing off against a smaller Confederate army under General Joseph E. Johnston. In addition, a cruel yet highly skilled cavalry general. Played in the movie by Johnny Depp, of course. And winner of the funniest Confederate statue award, <laughs> Nathan Bedford Forrest, was also nearby, doing his best to threaten Sherman's advance. But in a series of battles, Sherman dominated and pushed Johnson back to the city. But he was held just oh, outside of Atlanta on. itself. Oh, come on, oversimplify. City, but. You're so much better than going for this cheap laugh. I'm just kidding. That's actually tremendous. He was held just outside of Atlanta itself and was forced to lay siege. Meanwhile, the main show was happening to the east in Virginia. The Union's top general was finally about to face off against the Confederacies. Lincoln hoped Grant would bring something new to the eastern theater and bring something new. He did. As Grant began <laughs> moving south, Lee still regularly outmaneuvered him and inflicted heavy casualties, hoping to demoralize the North as much as he could. But here's what set Grant apart from others. He knew Lee was running out of men and that the North by comparison had plenty. Grant would throw his forces at Lee, and even when Lee repelled them, Grant, rather than pulling back, would give the order to keep moving forward and flank Lee again and again. In under six weeks, 80,000 men would be killed, wounded, or missing. In DC, Grant was criticized for being a butcher. But he's almost, if you look at the map, he's almost made it to Richmond, which doesn't justify the loss of 55,000 lives. It just in, in comparison to the generals that came before him who lost just as many, if not more, and made no progress. At the Battle of the Wilderness, the Union casualties were so heavy that Grant reportedly began to weep. But still, Grant could replace his losses. Lee couldn't, and he was being pushed all the way back to Richmond. Lee knew once he got there, he'd be under siege. 
then it would only be a matter of time. Close to Richmond, Grant again suffered horrific casualties in a miscalculated assault at Cold Harbor. Then, trying to be a tricksty trickster, instead of moving on Richmond directly, Grant moved towards Petersburg to flank the Confederate capital and cut its supply line. But, just like Sherman- Another but. Was Grant, did Grant have the numbers to leave them? Because if Lee has now pulled all the way back to here, one would assume Union troops would control this railroad, this one, and then if he could obviously take over Petersburg, then you're looking at this really circuitous route to get tr uh, supplies into Richmond. And again, it would basically be a, a siege Grant was halted point. outside of the city, and he too was forced to settle in for a siege. Two identical sieges would not be good enough for Lincoln's re-election. The people of the North saw the casualties Grant had been taking, and they weren't happy. To make matters worse, Lee had sent Jubal Early north to threaten DC with the hope of forcing Grant to withdraw troops from Richmond. Early was repelled on the outskirts of the city, with President Lincoln even attending as an observer, but the North had been given a fright. So with the war currently in a stalemate, who was to be Lincoln's opponent in the critical 1864 election? Sponsored by Uncle Joe's Snake Oil Emporium. For all your finest snake oils, visit Uncle Joe's Snake Oil Emporium. Use code HONEY to get 20% off your order of snake oil. Who? With the Democrat or 20% more, it won't matter, the stuff is useless. Let's choose. Guess what, baby? I'm back. That's right. What? General George B. McClellan would run for president against Abraham Lincoln. My fellow countrymen, if you elect me, I, the great General George McClellan, will fearlessly and valiantly win the war. Unlike this douchebag, many Democrats, however, including McClellan's running mate, wanted to end the war. So it's possible McClellan may have ended up fearlessly and valiantly making peace with the Confederates, which is exactly what they were hoping for. With Why do we, as a country, have this weird tendency when... <sighs> I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. When we think that we need a... a strong candidate to um to oust somebody who is wildly unpopular do we somehow always trot out just the weakest candidate ever the war in a stalemate and lincoln's still not popular it looked like mcclellan would win and the confederacy may have a chance at surviving after all lincoln himself said that without some kind of major victory it seemed exceedingly probable that this administration will not be re-elected well, fret not, Abe, because if it's a major victory you want, it's a major Sherman. victory you'll get. Atlanta had been under siege by General Sherman for just over a month. After a number of battles around the city, Sherman sent a force south to sever the city's supply line, and Confederate General Hood was forced to abandon it. Atlanta, one of the Confederacy's most important cities, had fallen into Union hands. For many, it was clear that the Confederacy's defeat was now inevitable, and the war ah! would soon be over. When you gotta appreciate that they can just be mirrored Ease of animation. The final results came in. Lincoln had won with an electoral college landslide, with the troops in particular voting overwhelmingly for Lincoln, which must have been touching for their commander in chief. Hey man, looks like you lost. No hard feelings? I Reason. didn't lose. I merely failed to win. In January, oh my Lincoln involved himself. Head <laughs> which one was that? Is that was that Johnson? The failing to achieve victory speech. Like, did, I didn't lose, I failed to achieve victory is something that we use to describe, I think Vietnam, I think Korea, maybe Desert Storm. In ensuring the 13th but Amendment made it through Congress. It obviously become a, a meme at this point. And historic vote, the amendment passed. Slavery would now be constitutionally banished throughout the nation. Black men and women watching the vote from the galleries knew the work had only just begun. A couple months later, at his second inauguration, with victory right around the corner, he didn't celebrate, he didn't gloat. Instead, he emphasized the need for reunification and binding up wounds. To him, Americans, North or South, were to again be compatriots. However, listening to Lincoln speak that day was a man who had no interest in reunification. John Wilkes Booth, an actor living in DC, was also a deep Southern sympathizer. And as the war turned against the Confederacy, depressed and full of hate, he was already plotting his revenge on the man he held responsible. With further Confederate losses, it was pretty clear at this point who would win. That doesn't seem like foreshadowing or anything. But still, Jefferson Davis showed no sign <laughs> of giving in. The North were frustrated to see the conflict being dragged out. Why waste more lives in Atlanta? General Sherman- Funnily enough, there is a statue where I live 
of the Lincoln Douglas debates. And I believe if memory serves correct, Douglas is doing this. Like Lincoln looks normal, but Douglas just pumping his fist. He so had the weird. key to forcing the Confederacy's hand. He had an unusually modern concept that an army could only survive with the support of the people. Strike at the people and the army collapses. Sherman decided to do something unprecedented. He would remove his 62,000 men from their supply line and march through the heartland of the Confederacy where they would live off the land. There, they would wreak havoc where they would we got an apple a berry and a boiled shit. live off the land no matter where we are in the world no matter what conflict one man always can go for the boiled shoe there they would wreak havoc as they marched they tore up railroads burned farms and destroyed communication lines they also liberated thousands of slaves the damage done was estimated at 1.4 billion dollars the tactics were cruel but to sherman it was better than losing yet more men in battle in December, he reached Savannah, Georgia. Was Sherman, is, Sher is Sherman an, uh, ah, easy for me to say. Is Sherman a Napoleon type? Is that why he has his arm and his jacket in the paintings? Because he's got tummy problems? But he wasn't done yet. Next, he turned north to inflict his punishment on the first state to secede, South Carolina. As he moved, he came ever closer to General Lee's army, still holding out at Petersburg. The siege of Petersburg had lasted for 292 days. 60,000 of Lee's men had deserted. Numerous Union attempts him. to break through had failed. But when the breakthrough finally came, it came quick. On April 2nd, a Union assault finally pushed the Confederates from their defenses. Hey man, there's no need to evacuate, right? You'll rescue us like last time, right? Sorry, can't hear you. <laughs> Lee narrowly escaped the city, hoping he'd be able to meet up with General Johnson and continue the fight. Grant chased him down. Richmond was evacuated, and Jefferson Davis went on the run. As they left, the Confederates set fire to military buildings, but the flames burned out of control, and as the Union troops arrived, they became firefighters. A couple of days later, Abraham Lincoln visited the war-torn city. Grant caught up to Lee at Appomattox Courthouse, where he trapped his forces. It was here. That's on April where we're going to have GGs, friends. 1865, that Lee saw no point in continuing. Uh, sir? Listen, bub. I drank a bit too much last night, and now I'm hanging like a fruit bat on a hot day. So whatever you have to say, I don't want to hear it. Uh, General Lee says he wants to surrender. But diggity dog. Grant and Lee met in the home of a nearby farm family. To be fair, that would be the kind of thing that I feel like could instantly remedy a hangover. I feel like Lee could have been shot in all of his limbs, and he still probably would have macarena all the way to the courthouse. Owned by a man who had tried his best to escape the Civil War years earlier. Wilmer McLean. All right. Can we all just hurry up and get this over with? <laughs> Martha, not now. <laughs> I'm cleaning. Do you want us to get rats? Grant and Lee, after years of war, now spoke respectfully to one another. When Lee left, his face filled with emotion. Grant's men began to cheer, but Grant ordered them to stop. He knew that now was the time for reconciliation. Just over two weeks later, General Johnson would surrender to Sherman ending the war for 89,000 Confederate soldiers in the largest surrender of the war. Not every Confederate state had surrendered, but the war was as good as over. Across the North, church bells rang out and celebrations erupted. In Washington, Lincoln gave a speech from the White House to a jubilant crowd. When do we reconcile, right? Shot of curiosity. Um, and I feel like I'm speaking for a lot of people in the U.S., the people that don't. Uh, get on Twitter and argue every day. The people don't get on Facebook and get banned every couple weeks. Just out of curiosity, when do we get to... Ra like, I'm hoping we don't have to go through this to make peace. I just would, you know, rhetorical question, but it would be nice. It would be nice. In which, among various things, he expressed his support for black voting rights. Lincoln had seen the nation through its deepest crisis. The presidency had visibly aged him. He had lost over 20 pounds. He said sometimes, I think I am the tiredest man on earth. I'm not sure tiredest is a word, but- I mean, that would be a good segue for like uh, Helix mattresses. I think Casper and Purple are out of business now, but you know, if if they want to sponsor Oversimplified, people get tired in war. Mattress companies, help them out. Jeez, the man's exhausted. Cut him some slack. On a carriage ride with Mary, Lincoln clearly was looking forward to being a president in a time of peace. He was apparently very cheerful, surprising his wife, and he told her that between the war and the loss of their son, they'd both been very miserable. Now, it was time to be happy. On the evening no. of April 14th, Lincoln attended a play with his wife and some friends at Ford's Theater. 
It was a comedy, and the president appeared to be enjoying it very much. In a nearby bar, John Wilkes Booth swallowed two glasses of brandy. He slipped quietly into the president's booth and awaited for the audience's laughter to rise. The president was shot in the back of the head. Booth fled the city. There's a video, or not, yeah, there is a video of, um, I don't think any video exists of that happening. So if you see those on YouTube, very clickbaity thumbnails. But there used to be a show called, like, it was called, like, What's Your Secret or something, or I Have a Secret. And they had on the show a guy who was, like, eight years old and was in Ford's Theater when that happened. And the dude, I mean, the dude, you know, looks a little bit worse for the wear uh, several, several decades later. But he points out, like, hearing the shot, he remembers seeing the guy jump on the stage, everyone running out of the, it's, it's a really cool video. Um, I'll link it in the description if you want to check it out. It's unrelated to oversimplified, but I remember seeing it and it's just, it's one of those things that I'm glad film came along when it did so that we start to document some of those people's memories. Like, I think there's also a video too of a couple Confederate soldiers being um, being interviewed about the war. And that's that's a really cool one too. Soldiers carried- The history rabbit hole on YouTube runs deep. Lincoln to a boarding house across the street. There, doctors declared there was nothing they could do. Surrounded by his heartbroken wife, son, and members of cabinet, at 7.22 the next morning, President Lincoln passed away. Never before had a president been murdered. A shocked nation mourned as a 12-day funeral procession carried Lincoln back to his home in Springfield, Illinois. On April 26th, Union Cavalry found John Wilkes Booth in a barn in Virginia where he was shot. Not long after, Confederate President Jefferson Davis was also tracked down and arrested. Imprisoned for two years, he was eventually released the North didn't want to put him on trial for fear the jury may rule that Southern secession had in fact been legal. To ensure reconciliation, other Confederate generals and politicians were allowed to re-enter life in the now restored Union. Scattered fighting continued into May when the last Confederate forces in Texas disintegrated. The Southern states came under Northern military occupation to prevent any further rebellion and a very difficult era of reconstruction began. Over three million Americans had fought brother against brother the civil war that's crazy that of the two-thirds that died yeah two-thirds of those that died were from disease and then yeah and i i would assume that this was the same kind of thing but it's just again old old school sounds like such a bad way to say it but older warfare versus modern warfare it's remains the bloodiest wild to look at in u.s history but the Union had been preserved. You could say the real winners were those who were to never again be slaves. Further amendments passed by Congress gave black individuals the right to citizenship and to vote. Significant progress had been made. However, entering into the 20th century, it was clear the fight for equality would continue. And the in 21st. modern America, the man who fought to preserve the nation and never gave up in the darkest of times stands as a symbol of honesty, empathy, humility, perseverance, and courage. A continuous reminder of what has forged America and what it should ever strive to be. A surprisingly wholesome conclusion from uh, Oversimplified, I feel. Normally, it seems like Oversimplified stays away from, I don't wanna say politicizing, cause that, you know, the idea that everyone should be equal is not political in and of itself, but, um, a nice, a nice thought, like a nice olive branch. I don't know. You, you see the end of that and you feel like you want to, if you had an argument with any of your friends or something, you feel like you want to tie up those loose ends and sort of make peace with them. So that is, uh, Oversimplified and the Civil War series. I feel like next, um, if I keep going with Oversimplified, it's probably going to be the like mini series, like the Bucket War and the Pig War and all that kind of stuff. Uh, let me know in the comments what you want to see if you've made it this far in the video. Please subscribe. Again, it helps the channel out a ton. I appreciate it more than you can imagine. Um, if you're in the U.S., have a safe, happy 4th. Enjoy a day off work, if nothing else. Uh, everyone else who is watching this, take care. And as always, I will see you for the next one.